So good morning, everybody. Good morning. I see Dr. Elkon is here so we can get started. <laughs> it is a uh, real pleasure and an honor to uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Anthony Rosen. Uh, Dr. Rosen got his uh, medical degree from the University of Cape Town in South uh, Africa in uh, 1984. And um, after a few years of uh, science and um, research, uh, he decided to uh, come to the United States in 1987 uh, to join uh, Alan Adarem's lab at Rockefeller. Uh, here in Seattle, of course, we know uh, Dr. Adarem really well. Um, he uh, proceeded from there to uh, uh, do an internship and a fellowship in uh, rheumatology at Johns Hopkins uh, studying in, in uh, 1990 and uh, joined their faculty in uh, 93 as an instructor and quickly rose up the ranks uh, to become a full professor in uh, 2002 uh, as well as a director of the Division of Rheumatology where he uh, still is uh, today. Um, he also became professor in uh, multiple other disciplines. I'm showing you here uh, just a uh, a, a fraction of all his uh, titles and duties at the, at the university. Um, in 2013, he became the v vice dean for research at Johns Hopkins, uh, having led their innovation efforts uh, over many years prior to that. So Dr. Rosen is very uh, well known uh, in the field of autoimmunity. Uh, he has published uh, a very large number of seminal papers in, in top journals and contributed greatly uh, to the understanding of autoimmunity and its mechanisms, uh, particularly the role of autoantibodies and what they may or uh, mean and how they might be involved in, in the disease. Uh, he also have, has a very extensive record of uh, teaching, mentoring, uh, service on uh, uh, study sections, uh, journal reviews, and so forth. Uh, a very impressive, uh, very thick uh, list of accomplishments. However, I thought uh, it would be interesting for you to hear something slightly different. So I did what um, uh, any scientist would do nowadays. I Googled him. <laughs> and I found a few things uh, that I thought would be uh, interesting to share with you. And, and uh, I didn't find any skeletons. There are no hidden emails from uh, higher office or anything like that. <laughs> So I did find, of course, a very large number of uh, Dr. Rosen's uh, important papers, including this one uh, from the late 80s uh, before he uh, uh, left South Africa. Um, I found a paper um, from the uh, lab of uh, Aladaderem at, at Rockefeller, uh, good old-fashioned signal transduction, as many of us were working uh, with at the time. And certainly I found this paper from 1994, which is uh, extremely well cited. I think it was a, a seminal uh, discovery in how uh, autoantigens might be presented and come about in autoimmune disease. Um, so in this particular uh, paper, uh, Dr. Rosen and collaborators uh, showed that in uh, apoptotic cells, the proteins that end up as autoantigens are segregated and located in very specific structures uh, which, which uh, may provide a mechanism for how they could be taken up by the immune system and presented uh, to result in the autoimmune response and the autoantibodies against these uh, interesting proteins. Of course, I found some pictures of uh, his lab hard at work. Uh, these are two former students, uh, Felipe Andrade and Eric Adaro, who are both now on the faculty of Johns Hopkins. And just from the look at their, on their face, I think they probably were discovering 
the mechanism for citrullination or something during this uh, photography session. I also found some surprising things. Uh, there's a huge volume, a brief introduction to South Africa, uh, written by uh, Dr. Rosen under a pseudonym. Um, it makes sense to me because in my uh, limited experience, you pretty much have to be from South Africa to become the director of a division of uh, rheumatology. <laughs> I found some pictures I don't understand at all how they have any connection, uh, the power of Google. And finally, I found this picture which I puzzled over for a while, but I think it represents uh, Dr. Rosen's uh, grappling with and trying to understand and tame uh, aggressive scleroderma. And, and with that, I would like to uh, uh, give the, yield the rest of my time to the gentleman from Baltimore. Uh, Dr. Rosen, please. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for that, um, for that great introduction. I will tell you that my, 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 um, my heart rate is about 220 because I was wondering exactly what he found on Google. <laughs> and um, you didn't search deep enough. <laughs> okay, so let me see if I can get my presentation up here. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Um, this is one of the great uh, academic health centers of the nation, um, and um, I'm honored to have the opportunity to, to talk briefly about um, some of these, these moments of wonder that have really driven um, my academic life for the past 30 years. Um, I'm going to talk about auto, autoantibodies in the rheumatic diseases. I'm actually going to focus mainly on, on scleroderma today, but if people want to see part two, then we're doing rheumatology rounds tomorrow, and you'll get a little bit more um, wonder. Um, and I call, I've called it markers of the primordial landmass. And I did see Keith, and good morning, and thank you for the invitation. <coughs> so I thought I would start with this um, note from uh, Darwin's di diary, on board the Beagle. Um, and he noted that the islands possess their own species, these species having the same general habits, occupying analogous situations, and obviously filling the same place in the natural economy of this archipelago that strikes me with wonder. And he was talking about his cruising around the Galapagos Islands, and as he went from island to island, he noted that the islands didn't have species that were d different. They didn't have their own species. They had species which were modified. And for him, that was the thing that filled him with wonder. Now, Darwin's tools were extraordinarily primitive, right? He had basically had his powers of observation, um, memory, the ability to write, um, and the ability to process what he was seeing. And the reason that, that Darwin was able to come to this conclusion that in fact informed uh, a lot of biological science over the next century, centuries, was that he was smart, he was intuitive, and he was lucky. And the luck was that on the Galapagos Islands, that spatial separation had neutralized time. Right? And so he was able, at a single moment, to look at island A and look at island B understand the, the local microenvironments and intuit that they had started the same, but they had evolved differently. So spatial separation neutralized the effects of time for Darwin. And what I'm going to argue today <clears throat> is that the immune system accomplishes that for us in the rheumatic diseases. So although the rheumatic diseases are probably the most complicated, and I don't want to get into an argument as to whose diseases are most complicated, but they are amongst the most complicated. And I must say, when I started rheumatology, I thought that we would probably never understand mechanism well. I am convinced that rheumatology is going to be the set of diseases that we understand the mechanism of these initiation and propagation of these chronic complex autoimmune processes before many other uh, specialties will understand this. Now, um, if you've been at Hopkins for your, 
um, almost entire professional life, it is, it is almost unavoidable to, um, to speak about um, William Osler um, in every talk. And I, I will point out that he, he said this um, in, in the late 1800s, to, most per, to make perfect the most difficult of all the arts, the art of observation, to call to aid the science of experimentation, to cultivate the reasoning faculties as to know true from false, these are our methods. And, and I will point out that we are, he, he was in a fortunate position back in the late 1800s. We, in our era, are probably in the most exciting um, time for humans to understand biology and disease um, because the, the art of observation we need still to keep alive, and I'm going to come back to why. The, the science of experimentation is orders of magnitude more than even the generation that immediately preceded us. And cultivating the reasoning faculty, I would say augment the reasoning faculty using modern information tools, I think this is the moment where human disease is really going to be solved in profound ways. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I think that the art of observation is still so important. Now, the human autoimmune rheumatic diseases, that lupus, scleroderma, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, Sjogren's syndrome, autoimmune vasculitis, all these, these, these rheumatic diseases bring with them this problem of multidimensional complexity. The populations that we study are genetically heterogeneous. The spectrum of disease is very diverse, and I'm going to point out a little bit out of that, of that to you in a minute. But most people know if you have a rheumatology patient, you send them to the rheumatologist because they're too complicated just for, for, for kind of general medicine. The phenotypes are incredibly complex and nuanced. The phenotypes are not pure, and there's considerable overlap, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There are numerous potential environmental forces which have been associated. And then there is this issue of kinetic complexity. That is that from the time the patient has the first event which is potentially recognized as being the beginning of a process, like autoantibodies in lupus, the, by the time they get their first symptom is generally five to 15 years later. And not everybody who has the first goes to the second. So there's tremendous kinetic complexity. Um, and then the patient isn't the same over time. It's not like you have it and you keep it and you, you're the same as you follow people along years. In fact, diseases get better and get worse, get better and get worse. Um, and they also evolve over time. They get additional features that accrue. Um, and so the, the rheumatic diseases with the, this multidimensional complexity are a huge challenge to understanding. And I, would, I think there are only two approaches when you have things that are that complex. One is study something else. Um, and the second is to embrace the complexity. And I'm going to hopefully convince you that the complexity is neutralized if you use the tools that you have to neutralize time. And there are three tools that are just easy, uh, easily available in rheumatic disease. The first one is to basically study patients over time so that instead of studying groups of people with disease which are complex, each patient has their own trajectory. And the trajectory really highlights biology of disease in ways that is incredibly profound. The second is that the immune system comes equipped with this vast capacity for memory and the immune system and activation of the immune system is a central part of the autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And then third is this issue of things happening at the same time which you don't expect to happen, concurrent events. And that happens to us clinically a lot. Um, and I hope I'll point out that, that when you focus on a couple of them, suddenly the world changes. Okay, so to talk about the phenotype and the trajectory, there are sub-phenotypes within disease. So this would be um, in patients with dermatomyositis, and there are all kinds of dermatomyositis. There's dermatomyositis with bad interstitial lung disease associated with immune responses to the amino acid RTRNA synthetases, uh, autoantibodies against MDA5 associated with really mild skin disease and a rampant uh, interstitial lung process, um, and so on. So there are many different um, subphenotypes and trajectories. In scleroderma, it's the same. There are different forms of scleroderma. On the top row, you see um, patients with a diffuse scleroderma, um, skin disease affecting the entire body, including the face, the trunk, 
um, arms, um, including the upper arms, um, disfiguring uh, skin changes, um, and um, interstitial lung disease. Um, patients with a more limited form of disease with, with this, this amplification of telangiectasia, uh, ischemic digit loss, um, these events that occur uh, at different times, um, and, um, and pulmonary hypertension. And um, this um, phenotype and trajectory is, is associated with one set of antibodies. This would be, for example, antibodies against propasomerase 1. And this is associated with a separate set of antibodies, antibodies against the centromere. So there is this, this tremendous wealth of phenotypes and trajectories which tell you that, that the diseases have important substructure. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that. And that the substructure is captured by the immune response. And so the next thing I'm going to talk about is, is immune memory. The reason that I was attracted to uh, study the autoimmune rheumatic diseases when I was a resident was that there was something that was so complicated about them and yet something that was so reassuring about them in that the diseases appeared to be associated with pretty specific immune responses. So if a patient makes antibodies against double-stranded DNA wrapped around a core of histones uh, or the sprycing ribonucleic proteins, they have lupus. That's the phenotype. If they have antibodies against topoisomerase 1, they have this diffuse form of scleroderma associated with interstitial lung disease. If they have antibodies against RNA polymerase 3, they have a diffuse form of scleroderma, but there's no interstitial lung disease. Um, but there is an association with renal crisis. If they make antibodies against the centromere proteins, they have this limited form of scleroderma associated with pulmonary hypertension uh, and ischemic digit loss. And so this idea that the immune response is highly specific and associated with phenotype, I think gives you this opportunity um, to use those as tools to understand the events that may have been present at disease initiation and then may subsequently amplify the process. And so the autoantigens, although they, in that list, there's nothing, you can look at that list and say, is something going to hit me that says they're all related? Um, likely not. Um, likely you're going to say, I don't understand what unifies them. But what unifies them is that they're targets of an adaptive immune response. And the adaptive immune response, although it is extraordinarily complicated in detail, is simple in principle. It is highly specific for the recognition of structure. Molecules that haven't previously been seen during development of the immune response and are subsequently presented are recognized as, as distinct. It's very context sensitive, right? So you don't tolerate um, stuff that isn't dangerous. You, you, you make an immune response to stuff which is dangerous. And the dangerous things, just for the purposes of discussion, could be infection or cancer. And then lastly, once you turn the immune response on, the immune response comes equipped with this vast capacity for memory. So that event that satisfied the criteria for initiating that immune response at the beginning of the illness are carried through the patient's course. So even if you are not present at initiation, you have the reflection of initiation that you can see by the very specific targets of the immune response. And I'm, I'm going to hopefully convince you that that could be used. The third is, um, is concurrent events. And Uh, oops. Okay, well, my slide is not here, but I will tell you, I'll tell you what the slide said. So, um, the concurrent events are these patients that you see that you know have the disease you're interested in, in this case, scleroderma or dermatomyositis, who around the time of presentation have a cancer diagnosed. And... Um, the, the slide that I was going to show you was an email from uh, 2005 from Fred Wigley, who, was head of the scleroderma, who is head of the scleroderma center, and it says something like, you're right, patient proof. And it says this. Um, he misspelled your, but he, he, said, <laughs> he said this anyway. He said, I'm seeing a patient 
um, who started in April last year um, and um, was found to have a small cell lung cancer. She was treated with radiation. She was treated with chemotherapy. Um, and um, she did well. And she started at the time of her, of, of her lung cancer, she started with Raynaud's phenomenon. First time. She was in her young 40s. First time with Raynaud's phenomenon. Everything was fine until exactly one year later when she presented with scleroderma, diffuse scleroderma, head to toe. Um, and um, um, she had um, renal crisis. Um, and she had RNA polymerase 3 antibodies. And he said, what a case. Um, is there something we can do? And I wrote back, wow, this is the kind of unique confluence that could prove things. And I'm going to explain to you why. Um, and so that single case of a patient who has these two diseases that really come together in time enough for a clinician to intuit, hmm, I wonder if they're related is augmented by the fact that if you do epidemiological studies on at least on patients with, with dermatomyositis and polymyositis, that that clustering of cancer and autoimmunity at the same time is seen in, in population studies. So um, this is a, a study from uh, Australia um, and um, a population-based study. If patients have a diagnosis of, of uh, polymyositis on the top or dermatomyositis on the bottom, and time zero is when their autoimmune disease presents. And then they looked um, to see when, uh, whether they had cancer and when it occurred. Um, and you can see that the cancer clusters around the time of presentation of the autoimmune disease. Um, and so the question is, is, is this a general phenomenon relevant to the rheumatic diseases? And if so, could we understand the mechanism? Now, um, the reason I call it the hunt for the primordial landmass um, is shown in the next few slides. Um, so um, for those of you um, who, who didn't know, because it was spoiled by the fact that Thomas told you I came from South Africa, um, I am from South Africa. And my accent, unfortunately, still shows just a touch of that accent. Um, and um, the, this is the mountains, the Drakensberg Mountains, actually the foothills of the Drakensberg Mountains, really beautiful uh, hiking territory, um, and that was me maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago um, uh, in the Drakensberg Mountains. Now, when I was a, a, a junior faculty member, I was a Pew Scholar uh, in the biomedical sciences, and they used to take us to some great place four years in a row for a meeting where you got together with all the other Pew Scholars, and one year they, and, and as part of that trip, they used to take you to some exotic place that was going to educate you and broaden your, your mind. Um, and one year they took us to these tipuis uh, all off the north coast of Venezuela. And um, the night before the trip, they, um, they brought in a guide who was going to take us around the next day, um, who um, said um, he, he'd written this article in National Geographic about the tipuis off the north coast of Venezuela. And he said, the interesting thing about these tipuis of the north coast is that they have species, unique species of flora and fauna that are shared with only one other place in the world, and that is the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa. Now, I know that, that, that the West Coast are, are all geographically literate, um, unlike the East Coast. And, um, and I will point out that the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa are here, and the tipuis off the north coast of Venezuela are there. And these tipuis, by the way, are these are separated from the coast of Venezuela by 50 to 100 miles. They're 8 to 14,000 feet coming up out of the ocean, um, and they're separated quite far apart. And the question is, is how can that be? So if you, if you, if you just see that, it's like, well, it, it cannot be. But of course, in the primordial landmass, those two were, were, were attached, and they separated and subsequently you know, evolved separately. But they had these common progenitors. And so the question is, when we see patients who present with rheumatic diseases who don't have cancer, or we see patients who present with rheumatic diseases and concomitant cancer, is the one informing us about the other? Is, the, is the, the fact that they come together showing us that at one stage in their life they in fact were attached 
and that in some cases they remain attached and the cancer presents, and in other cases, whatever the, whatever the immune response did generated the autoimmune process, but the cancer is no longer visible. And so that's the question. <clears throat> oh, here's the message. Okay, you'll see, how, you'll see I, pre, I got it pretty much, I got it pretty much right. Okay. So, so we believe that the this, this specificity of the autoimmune response um, and the strong association with clinical phenotype and trajectory provides this critical ability to triangulate in time and space and helps unravel mechanism. And I'm just going to show you a few slides on that. Now, in dermatomyositis and polymyositis, if you went to any rheumatologist and said, okay, um, is cancer associated more frequently around the time of diagnosis of dermatomyositis, polymyositis, everybody says, absolutely. No controversy, everybody agrees. Okay? Clinically, that's the impression. Epidemiolo epidemiologically, it's proven, but clinically, that's the impression. If you go to scleroderma physicians and say, okay, is cancer associated with scleroderma, with a sh people will say, no, no, there isn't evidence for that. And the question is, and I'll, I'll hopefully convince you, as there is, was tremendous controversy as to whether there was increased risk or not. And I hope that by the end of the time, I, you will agree with me that the reason for the controversy is the biology. There have been great series of cases where cancer and scleroderma come together in time, but they're small, and so people said, well, there, you do find these short intervals between cancer and scleroderma, but it's really not that common. Um, and there are examples of case reports of scleroderma where the cancer is removed or treated and the, and the scleroderma goes away, right? And so there is this tantalizing sense that this could be interesting. Uh, the scleroderma center is, is, is really um, <clears throat> uh, an extraordinary place. They have followed about 3,100 patients over uh, the 25 years or 20 years that they've been in existence. Um, Fred Wigley really took a very prospective approach to this, collect data prospectively, collect samples prospectively, um, and, and um, have them available to, to, um, uh, to do studies. Um, and so you really couldn't answer these kinds of questions if you didn't have that as your framework. So the first thing we did after Fred's initial uh, question about could something be done was we said, well, is this a single case of patient who has a cancer and scleroderma coming close together in time and has an, an identified antibody, or is it just really a mess out there? And so <clears throat> Amish Shah, who at that time was a, a fellow um, in collaboration with my, my scientific better half, um, um, looked at the, whether there was a temporal relationship between the onset of cancer and scleroderma uh, in patients with, with scleroderma with various antibodies. And this is what she saw. Um, she saw that if, you had, if the patient had antibodies against, and let me just say on the y-axis, is the sclerod scleroderma duration at the time of cancer diagnosis, and um, these are either patients who have antibodies to RNA polymerase 3, uh, antibodies to toparsomerase 1, antibodies to centromere, or negative. And what negative means is, um, is no antibodies to pol, topo, or centromere. Okay? And so what she found was that in fact, if you had cancer um, and you had antibodies to RNA polymerase 3, your cancer and scleroderma came together. In fact, the, the, um, the median was minus 0.6 years. So about six, seven months before uh, the scleroderma presented, the patient presented with cancer, and then scleroderma uh, a short amount of time later. If you looked with, in patients with toparsomerase or centromere, the, there was a, a pretty long distance between um, cancer and, and scleroderma. And then there's this interesting group of negatives. And um, for those of you who want to come tomorrow, I'm going to tell you about those. So what that gave was, I think, this moment for us to say that we probably have the pieces in place to be able to at least answer the question about whether um, the cancer and the scleroderma and the immune response and events in the cancer were related. <clears throat> and this is a study um, that is just worth pointing out has four uh, first authors, um, a, a cancer geneticist, an immunologist, a clinician, and an, another cancer geneticist. 
um, and um, three last authors. Um, and the goal was to actually say we have a group of patients that we can actually, we have the primordial landmass. Maybe we can answer questions about both what was present in that landmass and how the immune response had responded. So there were 16 patients um, who had scleroderma and cancer. The top eight had antibodies to RNA polymerase three large subunits, which gene name is, is this is the protein name for, for, um, for that, um, pol r 3 a um, In the bottom eight, they had um, cancer and scleroderma and um, antibodies against either TOPI, isomerase one or centromere. You can see in the top that these are clustered closely in time and on the bottom, largely not clustered closely in time. Um, and you will notice that breast cancer is pretty highly enriched. Uh, that is partly true and partly the fact that that was what we got. Um, the breast cancers, about 40% of patients with scleroderma and cancer have breast cancer, which is highly enriched. The first thing that Bert and colleagues did was they, um, they sequenced Polar3A, and interestingly, found somatic patients exclusively in the in the patient group uh, that had antibodies to Polar3. I'll say that that I, my lab is at Bayview, Bert's lab is is on the Hopkins main campus, and I was sitting at my desk one day when Bert called and said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm I'm at Bayview." He said, "Come over." I said, "Bert, I'm at Bayview." I'm going to drive three miles over. He said, come over, put the phone down. <laughs> and when I went over, he had the first patient, um, which is this patient over here, um, and the data was so incredible, right? It was, there was unequivocally using multiple methods. This patient had a somatic mutation, and then we showed that, in fact, some um, two others had. Now, what was interesting was that the frequency of the somatic mutation was lower than expected, um, quantitatively than for other mutations in that patient's cancers. And the question was, was raised as to, as to why was that? And there are a variety of explanations that we could talk about if we have time for discussion. <clears throat> but one of those was that the immune pressure against the mutation was um, uh, encouraging the cancer to drop the mutation and that it re represented uh, loss of heterozygosity at the pol 3 a locus. Uh, and Ken Kinza set up this series of assays to quantify um, LOH um, at the pol 3 a locus. And you can see that it was, it was very frequent, even in patients without cancer had, had loss of heterozygosity. Those were not found, neither mutations nor LOH were found uh, in, uh, in patients with different immune responses. So 75% of these POL3 patients um, have genetic abnormalities uh, at that locus. It's not a feature of patients with any of the other antibodies, and it's also not a feature of cancers without scleroderma, where the, the, uh, the frequency of mutation in pol 3 a is about 0.7%, so very infrequent. Next question was, <clears throat> there is a somatic mutation in the cancer, in the antigen that that patient targets, could we find immune responses against both the mutated and potentially the wild type form of the antigen? And I'm going to summarize a, a large amount of data to say the answer to that is yes. That on, in the CD4 lineage, there um, are clear uh, immune responses recognizing both the mutated form and the wild type form. When we looked um, at the T cells, that in fact, the wild type reactive um, uh, CD4s are totally different to the mutant reactive CD4s. Um, and so we could really use those to go back and look uh, in the cancer to say which ones were present. And for those of you who want details on that, you could come back tomorrow morning. Okay, so that led us to this following uh, model. <clears throat> and that is that there is this really tantalizing connection between the autoimmune rheumatic diseases, particularly those that present in middle to late life, um, and, um, and cancer. Um, and the, the idea is that during this process of, of cancer development, that you can uh, develop a mutation in an autoantigen, in this case, 
into the large subunit of pol R3, um, that, that that is processed and presented and generates an immune response. That immune response I'm showing here is red, meaning it's against the mutated epitope. Um, and red meaning the, the, these are not a specific cell, these are CD4s and CD8s that recognize the mutated epitope and that cells that express the mutated epitope are selected again. And that being, um, that selection potentially accounting for some of the, the loss of heterozygosity that you see at the pol r 3 locus. <coughs> but what's important, I think, is that, that the, the, the cells that appear to be directed against the mutated version um, appear to be directed against the mutated version and not the wild type version. And so, so cells that potentially don't have the mutation would not be seen by the immune response. But what we know is that these patients are manifesting autoimmune destruction of peripheral tissue and that there is an immune response against the wild type as well as the mutant form. Uh, and so the idea is that the immune response which is uh, generated against the mutant form spreads to the wild type form and now you have uh, immune effector functions that are against um, both cells that happen to express the mutation, cells that express the um, wild type version, be they cancer cells or normal cells. And that this is a, a, an important part of, of the ongoing drive uh, in scleroderma. So just to summarize uh, this part of the talk, um, the close temporal relationship between cancer and scleroderma onset is marked by particular autoimmune responses. And I told you today about the pol R3 immune response. Um, the, um, the, there are other immune responses uh, for example, against components of the minor spliceosome that are also associated with this a striking um, um, temporal clustering of scleroderma and cancer. The data suggests this model of uh, cancer-induced autoimmunity in scleroderma, where somatic mutation initiates the immune response to the mutated, spreads to the wild type. Um, and um, now I'm going to complicate it just a little. So, so why then? If you have a patient who presents with scleroderma with antibodies to pol R3, why do you only see cancer in 15 to 20% of those patients? So um, there are lots of potential explanations for that, and we spent a couple years hand waving about them all. Um, but I'm going to show you just a wedge which suggests that there's something really interesting about the people who have scleroderma, pol R3A, and no cancer. Um, and um, uh, when, when what you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And what we are really good at is identifying the targets of immune responses. So then the thing we naturally went to is just to ask as a first question, in the patients who have scleroderma with pol R3A antibodies who you follow for you know, at least five years and don't get cancer, do they have additional immune responses that are not present in the pol R3 patients who do get cancer? Okay, so that's the question. And, um, and this is a piece of the answer, and, the, and it was, it's interesting, and it, it's, um, it's really unequivocal. So um, the, the answer is this, that patients who have pol R3A antibodies and no cancer have a broader immune response. One component of that is, um, is that these patients also effectively make antibodies against the large subunit, and in fact many other subunits of pol R1. And if you look at the patients who make antibodies against pol R3 and pol R1, um, um, none of them have cancer except for one patient, one out of 80. Okay, so there's one out of 80 patients made antibodies um, to, um, to, to pol R1 and actually had a cancer emerge, and um, 16 patients <coughs> out of 88 without cancer had this pol R1 antibody. So that suggests, and there are more of these immune responses that still need to be defined, that suggests that this orthogonal targeting of the immune response of multiple components may be really important in determining whether or not that, that cancer may or may not emerge. Okay. Um, if anybody read into what I just said as, as that that's the answer, then 
I want you to rewind and, and not take that away, um, because there are other potential explanations, one of which is that, that the people who have polar 3 antibodies in whom cancer emerges are being driven by cancer, and the people who have polar 3 a antibodies who cancer doesn't emerge are in fact not being driven by cancer after all. Right? So don't assume that cancer is driving everything. I think that is, that is a, 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 a real um, um, caveat. But I'm going to give you more data, which, has, which suggests to us that there is this continuum and that the primordial landmass is present in probably many more people than we think it is, and that the effectiveness of the immune response um, um, de determines whether or not the cancer emerges or doesn't emerge. And so I'm going to just show you a, another piece of data which I think uh, buttresses that. So, the initial response is looking at the immune responses, the initial studies looking at whether the immune responses uh, in, um, in patients with scleroderma are associated with a higher um, prevalence of cancer were done within cohorts, right? That means that you're looking to say within all patients with scleroderma, what is the risk? What is the odds of having cancer if you have pol or 3 antibodies? versus if you have centromere antibodies, right? Or in the entire group. And so, so that, there is a problem with that, right? Because you actually don't have an absolute against which to compare. Um, and so, and I will say that that was um, raised by a, a reviewer on a paper um, in, a, in an incredibly helpful way, saying that it's a problem, but you could solve the problem by doing this analysis, comparing to a, a population um, uh, incident, um, so use the SEER registry. And so we went and did the exact same analysis now on the whole cohort comparing uh, to the SEER registry. And, and, and we asked whether there was a, a continuum of risk, whether the kind of antibody that a patient with scleroderma makes um, determines their cancer risk and, and, and what, the, what that looks like. And so um, I'm just going to show you briefly <coughs> that um, if you look at POLAR3, the, um, the, uh, the red line on the bottom, so that's the middle thing on the bottom, the red line is the, is the uh, SPHERE data, and the blue line is, uh, is uh, our scleroderma cohort data. So if you have POLAR3, um, your, um, your SIR is significantly higher, particularly early. Right? So you can see the SIR is <clears throat> at least threefold um, at, the, um, at the diagnosis and in that period immediately after diagnosis. Now what happens if we now take it and we broaden to ask about the other scleroderma um, populations um, in terms of antibodies? So if you look at all, um, basically um, if you take everybody with scleroderma, no matter what your antibody, the SIR for cancer is exactly the same as the general population. Right? Hence, the controversy as to whether scleroderma is associated with a high incidence of cancer. Um, Pol is higher. But interestingly, if you look at anti-centromere, the anti-centromere um, uh, incidence is lower. Um, and um, about 0.6 if you take the whole population, and about 0.3 to 0.4 if you take patients over 40. Okay? And so, that suggests that there are immune responses within the scleroderma spectrum that are highly effective at keeping cancer away, so effective that the cancer incidence in those groups is lower than, in fact, the, the general population. Okay, so the finding that POLAR1 plus POLAR3 or antisentromere are associated with a lower incidence of cancer is of interest. Together with the LOH, it suggests that, a different, that different immune responses may be more or less effective uh, at controlling cancer. We'll talk about what I think that means in a minute. Um, these uh, nuanced presentations, specific immune responses and disease behavior over time, suggest that the cancer immune interface frames more of the autoimmune rheumatic disease spectrum than just the polar 3 group. Um, and we believe that human uh, rheumatic diseases are going to provide important insights into natural and highly effective cancer immunoediting in humans um, and will shed light on the efficacy and complications of cancer immunotherapies. I thought I would just leave with this, 
this um, discussion um, of, of cancer immuno editing. And because um, I think that it frames the, the question well. And I realize that people believe more or less uh, in cancer immuno editing. And so I, I don't present it as, a, a, um, um, as the only construct. But I think it's an incredibly useful con construct with, within which to study the diseases that, that we're working on. Cancer immuno editing has been um, um, simplified into the three E's. Uh, I will point out that, that the concept of cancer immuno editing, in fact, is not a new concept. Um, and um, uh, Sir McFarlane Burnett uh, in 1957 uh, posited the immunosurveillance hypothesis uh, in which he said it is by no means inconceivable that small accumulations of tumor cells may develop because of their possession of new antigen potentialities provoke an effective immunological reaction with regression of the tumor and no clinical hint of its existence. And that um, uh, you know, was, was popular and then very unpopular and then like all things immunological had to re-emerge with a different name and therefore uh, cancer immune editing. Um, so I think that the, the, the general statement is that, that in the process of, of, of um, cancer formation, uh, that there are a variety of, of mutations, somatic mutations, um, and other uh, stimuli that, that um, activate this initial immune response, um, which could have many different outcomes. Outcome number one is that the initial immune response is able to see these antigens um, and effectively eliminate the cancer. And all that would remain in that, in that setting would be, if you've activated the adaptive immune response, would be the, the sniff, the fingerprint of that activation, right? Which has got a lot of memory and you potentially could find, but that that would be biologically eliminated with some sign that the immune system had been activated. The, the cancer, obviously, is genomically plastic, right? And the immune system, as it pressures the cancer, there are, is this, in fact, anything that you do to, to pressure the cancer is select an evolving uh, um, kind of cancer ecosystem, which is, which is going to be less sensitive to that um, uh, selecting force. And so it is possible that as the immune system works, so the cancer evolves away. But remember that, that the immune system is highly plastic, right? And the immune responses that we see in these patients with autoimmune disease, they, they um, start as a single um, kind of potentially anti-mutation directed immune response but they diversify, and you get intra- and intermolecular spreading even to the wild-type version. And if you look at the immune responses in patients with autoimmune diseases, in fact, they have this incredibly diversified immune response, which has always been a frustration that how do you turn that off when you have so many components that have been taken up in generation of this autoimmune response? And so the immune response is also plastic. And so that sets up potentially this equilibrium phase where the immune response pressures the cancer, the cancer evolves, the immune response follows, the cancer evolves, the immune response follows. And at that stage, right, basically the cancer is not gone, but nor is it biologically relevant yet. And that the time that we um, as physicians see cancer is when it goes into the escape phase. And the escape phase potentially represents that something about that equilibrium is off. It could be something equilibrium off the equilibrium on the cancer side. That is, that the cancer, you know, puts up a checkpoint. The cancer does some other knockout blow that the immune response cannot follow, and then that the cancer then starts evolving on its own. The, it could equally be on the immune response side that the immune response has another insult, um, and potentially the biggest insult being aging but that there is this additional insult and that the, the, the balance between the immune response and the cancer is now becomes more favorable to the cancer and therefore the cancer evolves. So we really believe that this kind of the, um, the human rheumatic diseases as models potentially of, 
natural cancer, effective cancer, immunoediting uh, is incredibly interesting. And the lovely thing about them is that you have patients that have followed over a long time, you have samples that are present, you're able to see the target tissue, you're able to see the cancer, um, and um, um, we think it's a powerful system. Okay, so some final thoughts. Um, we believe that human diseases identify important biological pathways and regulatory nodes. Those are the things that we, if we could understand human disease, we would really have a much more profound understanding of, of the basic biology of humans. Nuanced presentations in disease behavior, behavior over time hint at the existen, existence of this powerful organizing structure underlying chronic disease that would have attracted Darwin's attention. What Darwin didn't have was tools. What we have in the modern era is these extraordinary tools, measurement tools, data tools, intervention tools, um, and therefore this is really the moment for, for humans to, to solve many of these, of these chronic uh, problems um, that are so costly both in terms of patients' uh, lives and in terms of, of, uh, of treasure. Um, and lastly, you know, my strong belief that patients define the relevant questions and hold the answers to all these questions. And therefore, academic departments of medicine are more relevant today than they ever were, um, and that they are treasures that really need to be protected. Just to put up a few acknowledgements, um, these studies were done as a, as a, um, a partnership with, with my wife uh, and scientific partner. Um, you know, we have had a very uh, successful um, scientific uh, and, and life collaboration. And people who told us at the beginning, don't do that. It's incredibly dangerous. And who now, 25 or 30 years later, say, hmm, not bad. Um, <laughs> and um, what's the secret? And um, um, I will tell you, if she were in the audience now, I would say this, so, so she knows I say this. The secret is that I can take criticism. <laughs> um, um, the scleroderma studies were done by uh, Amish Shah, Laura Hummers, Fred Wigley, the SEER data um, by Taki Gusa. We have the, um, the partnership of Scott Zieger in, in ongoing studies in scleroderma that are incredibly exciting. Um, the Pol-1 uh, studies were, were done uh, as collaboration with Mariki Laiho. Um, I didn't speak about those. The, um, the studies with, um, uh, on the cancer genetics which are ongoing um, uh, were done as a, a partnership with uh, Ken Kinsler, Bert Vogelstein, uh, and their uh, extended group. Uh, and I am happy to take questions. So, Anthony, uh, terrific talk. So, in how do so what did we lear, what do we learn from the patients who get cancer in scleroderma? So, what's different? You know, what's different in the T cell response, or what's different in the host response, so we understand why they got scleroderma? Um, I don't need to I don't need to repeat the question because you use the microphone. Okay. Um, so, I think that that there are. Um, um, it's, it's useful to think of this construct of what the initiation um, events are that turn on an immune response. Um, and then secondly, what are the events that focus that immune response in this self-sustaining, amplifying way on a highly restricted group of cell tissue? And that second piece, there's not a whole lot understood about, okay? Um, but if you come tomorrow, I'm going to tell you some things about that. Because I, I, I think that, that the, the, I think this is really, initiation is really important to understand what might be focused on a cancer and how effective that could be. The next question is, why do people get this devastating response in tissue? And, and could we affect that without stopping the anti-cancer forces? That's an important question. And the short answer to that is that my strong belief is that the focus of a particular immune response and the association of a particular immune response with a particular phenotype um, suggests that 
these immune responses are focused on a tissue or a differentiation state in a tissue that um, are critical partners in the ongoing pathogenesis. So I don't believe that the immune response alone is what's causing the scleroderma, but rather that the immune response in, con in concert with the changes that are occurring in the target tissue that are feeding each other forward. And I think that the next thing is for us to really understand what that looks like. I'm going to tell you the story about what it looks like in mastitis tomorrow, and I have no idea what it looks like in scleroderma. I think we don't, we haven't thought about it right. I think we're not applying the right tools, um, but I'm convinced we will be able to. Um, but I think the target tissue is really critical to understand. Thank you for a lovely, uh, thought-provoking talk and your work. Um, I'd like to um, enlarge the arena um, in saying that this is a female predominant disease. And by the same principle by which you have shown in cancer, um, there is an increase, as Maureen Mays has shown, in women who have had uh, uh, pregnancy loss, either through miscarriage or elective termination. Those can be genetically anomalous, and the exact same principle could hold that you have an immune response to genetically anomalous cells. And I would just like to suggest that an elephant in the room is that uh, one of those continental drifts is the original primary um, mother-child relationship, which then separates. Um, and that looking at that immune response, and there's tremendous um, epidemiologic data in terms of cancer prevention and cancer risk according to a birth versus not necessarily a miscarriage, and the same with some of our autoimmune diseases. Thank you very much. It is a, it is a great comment. And I think that that aperture, in fact, needs to open. Uh, I think it's a great, it's a, it's a, it's a great suggestion. Again, thank you for a lovely talk. What are your thoughts about use of autoantibodies as tumor markers, then, and uh, potentially uh, with surgical removal, for example, without immune suppression, would the levels of autoantibodies be a reasonable way, or is, have they been shown to be helpful? in monitoring cancers? Uh, another, another great question. In, in cancers from older um, autoimmune rheumatic disease patients, the, um, and the, the number of, of reports of this is quite small, okay? So we have to take that into account. But um, the immune response um, can, can um, ameliorate markedly after cancer removal, right? And um, you know, I'll say that, that some of the patients that we, um, that we studied who had a cancer, whatever, 10 years ago, cancer got removed, and, um, and the question is, what happened to their scleroderma? Um, there are some people, in fact, the scleroderma totally went away. Um, and their immune responses have markedly waned over time. So um, I think that, that the, uh, in that subgroup, I think that potentially there's use. In the general population, so we've done a few studies um, on patients with um, breast cancer, for example, to ask what is the prevalence of autoimmune rheumatic disease antibodies associated with myositis and scleroderma in all comers with breast cancer. It is vanishingly small. So. I think that there seems to be an association between you've got to manifest the phenotype if you're manifesting this particular immune response. Now, the likelihood that there are other anti-mutinome immune responses that do diversify to, to the wild type and that you could pick up in more cancer more broadly, I think that is much more likely. Um, and in fact, when we, when we look for some of that, you find immune responses um, um, not against these things, but against other things in patients with, who, who have had cancer, particularly when you, when you treat them with checkpoint inhibitors. You, you do find these things coming out. Great. We've got a few more questions, but I'll ask um, you to come down and ask Dr. Rosen your questions, and let's give him one last um, round of applause.